Yo, yo, yo. Hey, guys, welcome back to another amazing edition of the Best Practices Show podcast. Today, I bring on a dear friend of mine, Dr. Jeff Rouse from Spear Education. And they were out doing an amazing workshop in Charlotte. And someone asked a question. And it got under his skin, a little bit of a pet peeve. And you're going to hear about it in this podcast episode. It's a great one. And Dr. Rouse describes why treatment planning and digital are not the same thing. Please listen to this. I hope you enjoy it. And we'll see you soon. Hey guys, welcome back to the Best Practices Show podcast. You know the jam here. I get the best speakers, teachers in the world, and you're going to listen to one of them today, and they get to share what's on their mind to help you create a better practice and a better life. And today we're going to dive into a controversial subject. You're going to love this one because the guy that I have on the podcast today, Dr. Jeff Rouse, been a dear friend of mine for a long time. I've actually been to his house to drink tequila. And if you haven't, you need to do it because it's a once in a lifetime experience. And uh, I'm, I'm actually, we're just going to jump into it. So thanks for being on brother. I always love having you on the show. It's always a blast to be back with you. It's been a while actually. It's actually, so it's fun to, fun to be back. Yeah. It's actually been long, too long of a while. And so I just put you in a headlock and said, you're coming on today. Let's do it. So, um, and as we were talking about what to discuss today, you just got back from Charlotte from your amazing event. I actually saw it all over social media and something kind of got underneath your skin. And I've, I, I was telling you, those are some of the best podcasts we have is if you listen to something that gets under Dr. Jeff Rouse's skin. We're going to talk about it today. So, Jeff, take us through the whole experience. Where were you and what got underneath your skin? Tell us. It is funny that every time we get together nowadays, it seems that all I talk about is things that make me upset. <laughs> it's not <laughs> always. An entire, an entire podcast full of Rouse's, uh, Rouse's pet peeves. So, um, Well, what got me this time? Actually, it's not just this time. Um this has been a, an issue that, um, that Bill Robbins and I, uh, who did the global diagnosis um, stuff together, and you've had on a ton. Um, Bill and I have always been uh, focused on diagnosis and the lack thereof, basically, in creating treatment plans. And the, um, let me take this out, the issue that we had in the past was people having a lack of diagnosis and just working off experience. So they would go in and treat cases based on whatever their background happened to be, be it um, a restorative dentist, ortho, whatever it happened to be. And we'd look at the case and go, there wasn't a systematic approach to the thought process. And in fact, you'll see it all the time on social media posts where they put a picture up and from this one picture, people will start throwing out how to treat the case. And so you go through and they're like, the other day I saw one, it was just a picture of a person from here to here, smiling, not really big, but just barely smiling. And the first post was they need orthopedic surgery. And it's like, wow, that's a big leap for one photograph. That's not all that good. And yeah, it just kept going through, just throwing out plan after plan after plan. And it was just sort of how they felt. So Bill and I kept saying, you need a system, you need a system. Well, along comes this idea of digitally designing a mock-up. And mock-ups have been around in an analog world for years and years and years. And we've always talked about that in order to really sell certain cases, it's always helpful that you could go in and wax everything up, create a mock-up 
and put it in the mouth and let them see what what it looks like. And all the digital software did was just speed that process up. And so I love the idea behind it of creating a motivational mock-up. And so when DSD or Christian talks about doing that, I think that's perfect. I absolutely agree with the whole concept of being able to motivate a patient to continue on and create the desire to do dentistry. Got it. Um, the problem, the problem comes in when you believe that's treatment planning because it's not. Mm -hmm. It's a motivational mock-up to get people interested in doing something, but it tells you nothing about how to actually do the dentistry. And so what upset me? What upset me was we were giving uh, an extensive, quite long lecture on how to do, how to treatment plan. And we're doing it not in the global system, but in the, the spear world, which is facially generated treatment planning facially generated treatment planning begins with aesthetics. So you always figure out how to set the maxillary anterior teeth, and then you work your way out from there, just like you're setting a denture. And then we work to function, structure, and biology after there, afterwards, a very systematic approach to looking at the world. And when we finished the first part of the lecture, there was a critique from a few members in the audience, not, not a lot, but anytime somebody critiques you, it feels like everyone, right? You know, right. whenever you're giving a speech and there's one person, it's like, ah, how can that person, right? So it wasn't that big a deal as far as numbers wise, but it, it just got to me because this has always been a point of contention, which is, the critique was, you've done all this stuff for us. You spent the day with us, but you didn't show us any digital. Digital smile designs. Well, they're two completely different things. The digital designing doesn't show you how to treatment plan the case. And it simply is a, is a way of giving an illusion to a patient to create a desire to act. But it doesn't treatment plan the case. And in fact, I would argue in some cases, it actually does quite a bit of harm because unless you're skilled at treatment planning, you don't know what can and can't be accomplished. You just simply pick out the perfect place for a smile. And it doesn't matter if the teeth are going to actually work with that final smile at all. And it ends up creating the need for more dentistry, some dentistry that doesn't really need to be done. I mean, lots of, there's tons of problems because people conflate one with the other, treatment planning with smile design. So, um, so that's, that was my, my issue this weekend was this idea that we are somehow behind the times and archaic and analog or however you want to describe us because we didn't show digital smile design we instead taught people how to treatment plan yeah and so that that's what got me going all right so let's keep going on that so let's define it before we start moving on and you said treatment let's define treatment planning and digital so and you said treatment planning is how to think you know you have to think and then give us a further definition on the others as we start to go down this road so you no know, treatment planning is well if you start in the in the spear world it's figuring out where the central incisor the incisal edge of the central incisor belongs in a three-dimensional plane so it's not only in a vertical horizontal fashion but also in an ap fashion so you have to figure out exactly where it belongs and then you work your way around the rest of the arch okay that is where the teeth belong treatment planning is how do I actually get the teeth into that position? And more importantly, in the global diagnosis system, how do I get the gingival architecture into the position that it needs to be for me to actually accomplish the dentistry that I'm describing? So that could be everything is fine. It works perfectly. Let's go, you know, let's rock and roll. All we need to do is make the teeth prettier than what they are. They just have a bunch of restorations in them. 
Unfortunately, the majority of the cases that people are using smile design concepts on are cases with significant amount of wear, significant amount of erosion, teeth that are malpositioned, teeth that are twisted, turned, or something is off in the totality of the smile. Well, in those cases, the gingival architecture is off, the positioning of the tooth is off, everything's off. And so you have to, in treatment planning, figure out how I can get the teeth and the gingiva to work within this framework or idea of where the perfect smile is. So first you have to figure out what ideal is, then you have to visualize what ideal is, then you have to use certain eight tools <laughs> that are available to dentists to get everything in the right location and figure out for each tooth and then for the totality of the smile and the now the bite in order to get all that to happen. Um, Smile design, on the other hand, simply limits it to, let me show you a pretty picture of where the teeth could, where it would look better on you. Has right. nothing to do with the reality of the case below it or behind what you've drawn. It's just, this is where the teeth, this would is where the teeth would look really good. And here's a, a model of tooth that would look pretty on this particular patient. That's right. great. I love it, but I love it for what it's intended for, which is selling the patient on the design. Yeah. Unfortunately, when you confuse it and call that treatment planning, then you run, you run into real problems with the overall case. Yeah. Now you're good at conflict. I'm not. And so you guys are <laughs> teaching in Charlotte, right? It's you and Greg. And then you get to the Q and a section and you've been given this feedback and you're like, okay, let's just go there. Yeah. And then you had a couple of images on the smile cloud. Can you tell that story? Well, I just, I pulled up and it doesn't matter. I mean, there are any number of different design softwares out there. There are tons of different ways that you can actually do it. Design, smile cloud is one of them. I just happen to have some pictures from, so it's not, they all suffer from the same problem. Um, it's not particular to that one, that one company. Um, the idea that everything is additive, the idea that we draw in the most ideal smile for that particular person is exactly, they're all the same. So in this case, I pulled up a picture and I said, here's, here's the pre -op, here's what the smile software said the smile ought to look like. I 100% agree that smile would look amazing. But I also know because I know how to treatment plan cases that that smile cannot be accomplished with the teeth in the position they're at and the gingiva in the position that they're at. So you have to learn how to treatment plan to make that software work to your advantage. If you miss the, if you don't know how to treatment plan, you will get frustrated by that software because it's going to require you to do more dentistry than your patient base probably can do. Okay. Cause most patient, most people that are doing this don't have a lot of patients that can do full mouth rehabilitation. I mean, that's me included. Right. I don't have a lot of people walking in the door all the time that say, design the most perfect smile for me. And Oh, by the way, now that you've designed the smile, all the teeth are in the wrong location, which means I have to do the lower teeth as well to get the function that I'm after. I, I don't have a lot of those people. And design softwares would lead you to believe that that's, that's the treatment plan. And so now you're going to be designing these huge cases that really you don't, own, you don't need to do in most of the in most situations. And in fact, the case that I had in mind really was had altered eruption, which is a gingival issue that needed to be taken care of. And it needed some orthodontics and it needed a handful of dentistry at the end. The teeth were, would have been fine and beautiful. So instead of receiving a full mouth worth of restorations, the case would have gotten orthodontics and maybe four to six teeth would have been restored. Now, can my patients that come into my practice afford 
four to six teeth worth of dentistry after some orthodontics to get the teeth in the right place and a little crown lengthening procedure. Yeah, I got people that can do that because that case now is two years long, not, you know, four months long with just cutting down teeth and putting crowns on or six months long, however it takes you to, to do all that dentistry. So, uh, yeah, it, it, it leads people to overtreat. It leads people to do some pretty damaging things to teeth and tissue. Um, and it, I think in the long run, it's going to lead you to not do as much dentistry rather than, than be able to, to, to do cases like this. Because, like I said, I, I could get away with doing that case significantly easier. Right. Right. Can you speak to this too? You and I were chatting. It is further exacerbated when you get into printing. So, you know, a lot of dental offices scan for crowns. Then you start to incorporate the print and then God forbid you've heard this phrase, you know, I don't have any stone in my office anymore. Can you put those three together for us and help us think through that maze? Yeah. You know, that, that actually is, um, well, once again, it goes back to the case this weekend. And part of the case that I was, that uh, issue with the case is that the woman was canted as well. Um, so her smile was canted and the way it was taken care of was they were just going to cut the gums and make them level and then cut the teeth off and make those rather than correcting the can. And also rather than recognizing that if you have a canted occlusal plane, you actually have a joint problem on the opposite side. And so that was never addressed. There was no discussion associated with that. There was no plan associated with that. So once again, a lack of diagnosis in the overall case. Um, but it then led me to the next step, which is thinking through all these practices that are now telling me I'm all digital. I, you know, I don't analog is, you know, is passe. And, um, and I, I would, I just would remind people that at the current moment, digital has some limitations that if you want to do these types of cases, you've either got to be very invested in expensive software and very time consuming effort in order to transfer information correctly to your virtual articulator, which I found very few people do. Now, the ones that do it, that's great, but the majority of practices are not invested that deeply into digital. They scan for a crown, they scan for a night guard, they may print the night guard in the office, they may make casts in the office, they may store, store, store digital files in the office, but they're not so invested in the case so as to have the ability to put a virtual face bow to it and a face on it. And so if they, if the patient is canted, like in the case that I'm, I was referencing, if you try to send that off to the laboratory or even something as simple as send it to Invisalign and, or a, some sort of orthodontic scan system, I mean, if they're canted and you level that can't virtually, your wax up is going to be completely off. Your orthodontic movement is going to be completely off. Everything's going to be off. And so the idea that a face bow is, is gone to me, it's not reached that point in time. And, and there's, I mean, we can continue the story, but there are so many things that while I have a three shape scanner in my office, I choose not to use it because I can get things done so more efficiently by simply staying in the analog world at this point in time. So um, back to critiquing the idea of treatment planning because it isn't digital. It's the same with critiquing anything that's that has analog and digital options. While you, it, it, it is very limiting to throw everything into the digital world unless you're really willing to live in that world completely. And you're going to have to be so invested financially and, and time-wise to even make it happen 
that I'm sitting back and having a cup of coffee and counting my money at this point in time because I'm done yeah. uh, with with many of the things. And and so if if you want to be involved that deeply, that's awesome. And the people I know that are are passionate about it. And so that's that's their love of dentistry. They love doing that. And I think that's fantastic. I think it's amazing some of the things that they're able to accomplish and workarounds and such. When I say, well, this is a problem. No, I can do it this way, that way, the other. I think it's phenomenal that they can do it. That's just not the regular dentist. Yeah. And so too many of the regular dentists give up on analog because they, I don't know why, honestly, that they do. I think they, they want to seem progressive, but it just makes their life harder. Right. So I'm going to go right there and ask you that question. So I get this question all the time, and I'm going to go ask you to go back to what you just said. You know, some of this is financial limiting, and it's also changing fast. You'll love this. So when you come to Milwaukee, I'm going to take you upstairs. One of the largest digital printing companies, I won't use their name, is right upstairs. They didn't have one floor. They have two floors. And I get a tour, and they have what's called a printing graveyard. You'll love it. The printing graveyard are printers that were viable 12 months ago, but now they're useless. And so they have a graveyard and you can see how big they are. And then they walk you over and go, these are the new ones, which are 50% of the size. And they have like a couple mock-ups. So, so I'm like, those were viable one year, like one year ago. We just put them on the wall to remind us that's the graveyard. So it's moving fast. And here's my real question. So I have a lot of dental students that listen now, Jeff. And a lot of young dentists just getting started. Buddy, I'm totally picking up what you're putting down. So walk me through this. How do I think about 30 years? Of, where would you start? You know, do I do a little combination of both? I know what I would say. Go to facially generated treatment planning first. You know, figure, get to, get to think yeah. well. But where, how do I put this puzzle together? So actually, uh, you know, when you and I talk ahead of time uh, about what we're, what we're going to visit about. And before I actually got on the air, I was, was, I was thinking about it, making notes to myself. And at the top of the page, I actually wrote young dentist. And uh, because I know that that's a big focus and a big passion of yours to help out young dentist and getting into practice. Um, I have to say that if I was a young dentist today, I would do everything in my power to get really, really good at analog with a little smattering of digital. But remember digital, I mean, if you think about what you can, I can do everything analog. I can do everything. There's nothing, there's nothing that I, I can exit my practice having never practiced digitally and be just fine. Okay. And it's just learning to work with in that world. And by the way, I would, I would note that all the big name people, for the most part, if you put together all the big names of, in dentistry right now and said, like, tell me how they practice, they're analog. Really? Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. So you think about anybody, you're, you're sort of like, oh, yeah, they're really good. They're really good. They're really good. When it comes right down to the difficult cases, they're all analog. Interesting. Okay, bigger cases. Cases that are off somehow, all the all the hard cases they do, they're always doing an analog. So if that's true, which I know it is, why do you think that you have to be digital just to kind of keep up with stuff with people? Uh, you know, um, I find it a shame that Texas Tech University Dental School in El Paso went all digital. They don't teach anything analog, which I think is ridiculous. Um, I feel sorry for the graduates that come out because it's not a huge percentage of the practices right now that they're going to try to interview in are digital enough to, to match what they know how to do. And they're going to be lost trying to fit into a practice. So if I was a new dentist and going out and trying to get continuing education, I would go somewhere and learn how to do things in an analog fashion, learn how to make a face bow, learn what an articulator does, uh, learn how to use stone on an articulator, learn the proper way of doing all these things. 
so that you, I mean, if you want to print a cast, that's fine, but the cast doesn't today have the detail that that stone does. It's not even close. A printed cast is not close to a stone cast. And, you know, there are reviews all the time in the literature to tell us that. So are there cool things that can then be done digitally? Yes. But with the background of analog and how knowing how to work analog, you know what the deficiencies are as well to digital. So you can then pick out the strengths of the digital and use it. That's what I, how I work with it in my practice is when I have something that I know digital does really well, that's when I use it. When I know there's something that analog does better, that's when I use it. And so that's what I would do. That's, that was my note about young dentists is I would not throw in completely to the digital workflow until you really own analog and then the other workflow makes complete sense and you pick and choose your cases the other thing that we started with was the smile design stuff and so long as a young dentist is going into the smile design world knowing that that's not treatment planning that's a way of of motivating a patient if all they do is say this is a motivational mock-up that's that's what i get from it then it's a wonderful tool wonderful tool it's easy it's fast now i would say that a lot of the the design work is being done by technicians i think you need to check the work right make sure that it makes sense what you're getting but if it does it's awesome to use for a motivational mock-up but the frustration a young dentist is going to get is they're going to look at it and go, now what do I do? Right. How do I, how do I actually make this happen? And if you don't have a background in treatment planning, you are going to do crown lengthening to mimic the gingival contours on the mock-up. And if a tooth is in the wrong place, you're going to cut the bejesus out of the tooth in order to make it happen. Or you're going to not cut so aggressively and you're going to have to warp your crowns around, which won't mimic the mock-up anymore. Yeah. So if you want to get digital smile design, go learn how to treatment plan. And so that you know how to actually make make it happen and marry those two technologies or marry the technology of smile design with the intelligence of treatment planning so that they can work the way they're supposed to work, which is to the benefit of the patient. And that you're not just crowning or veneering everything you see there, that you actually get their teeth in the right location. You get the tissue in the right location, but you do it the correct way. You don't force the case once you get to that point in time because you know what needs to be done. Yeah. I love it. I love it. I have like 30 more questions, but I can't keep you forever. Um, I'm going to have you back again and again. We're going to have a special segment. (laughs) Jeff Ralph's Pet Peeves, and it's going to be awesome. I love it. Now, you also dropped a bomb and let us know that some of the best dentists in the world that we know actually do any other any other secrets you're withholding that the listeners wouldn't know or would get wrong Uh, well yeah actually there are some of the best dentists in the world don't actually treatment plan very well they do really beautiful dentistry but their treatment planning is not that not that well done so greg kenzer and i um we have a, a, and actually I used to do this with Bill all the time, whenever the magazines would come to the office and we would, we'd go, oh, look at this. But now it's Greg Kinzer and I, we send cases back and forth off of social media and it's always uh, names of people that you would know. And it's cases that we look and go, they completely mess this one up. So wow. we're routinely sending cases back and forth. Um, um, and it's a pretty common mistake that people make. It's missing altered eruption of teeth. So they're working with short teeth, short fat teeth, instead of actually altering the gingival architecture. That's the number one mistake people make. Wow. That's for another so, podcast. And it's just a treatment planning issue. 
if they learned, if they had gone through a sequential way of treatment planning, like we presented FGTP or global, you wouldn't miss it. You'd never miss it. Yeah. One thing that's um, coming back to me, you and I have sat in many sessions of the Seattle Study Club Symposium in the world treatment planning sessions. And it's amazing how these teams, now we're talking teams of people, would put together a treatment plan for a patient and they would be so different. You'd be like, how could they, I mean, so there's a lot of different directions and, you know, there's a lot to learn from that. So, um, you watch those sessions, you'd be like, yeah. whoa, can you just comment on that just for a second? Um, yeah, the, the, it, and it's exactly the discussion we had, um, earlier. There are groups of people that uh, while they are very skill, skilled clinicians um, in whatever their their particular skill is, if you don't have a systematic approach to looking at the smile and the bite and all the details of it, but instead you throw something out and start spitballing treatment plans, it's going to be driven by, usually driven by the most powerful uh, personality of the group whoever that happens to be, and it's going to be driven by their experience. Oh, I treated a case like this. And if they treated a case that mimicked it, but wasn't exactly it, then they get it completely wrong. Um, and it's also driven by their biases instead of just the facts of that particular case. The ones that are done best are the ones that are always done in a sequential fashion. We gather data. We made a diagnosis of the problems. We created a visualization of where we think the teeth need to be in the final case. Here were our challenges in getting the teeth in that location and the gingival architecture in that location. And here's how we address those challenges with interdisciplinary planning and, and execution of the case. And those people that do it in that systematic fashion don't miss small details that can actually throw off the case. Because you know, the cases that they throw out there have always some twist to it. They're not just the teeth are in the right place, make them prettier type of thing. There's always some unique twist to it that needs a systematic approach. That's why that's why FGTP, facially generated treatment planning, has been so successful for such a long period of time because it follows a pattern, and the pattern is true for every single case. It doesn't matter what the patient looks like, what the damage is. You do the exact same thing every time because if you do it the other way, you're coming up with this magical treatment planning philosophy for each case that walks in and it just simply doesn't work. Yeah. yeah. So you see that. Yeah. I want you to talk about that. And if you haven't been to facially generated treatment planning, you got to go. So we're going to talk about that in just a second. But any last thoughts you have, Jeff, on... This event that happened. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I hope I hope that I said it enough times that um, that it I, I that people understand I and I know they won't because I know there'll be comments about this that he's you know, he's a dinosaur, he doesn't understand, you know, it's you know, he's old school and and I do understand. I, I honestly do understand what digital can do for you and the benefits that digital can have for you. And the way I understand that is I know how to do analog. And I know what analog can do better than digital. And as digital evolves, because my this discussion a few years ago would be completely different. Like if only you know, three, four, five years ago, Digital couldn't do a lot of the things that it can today, and so I trust it more than I would have in the past. In the smile design world, it's always been the same problem, though, since its introduction. It, people are taking it as a treatment planning tool, and it absolutely is not, and it's never been marketed as that. It's always been marketed as a way of creating a vision for the patient as to what can be done so that you get this motivational mock-up. And all the people involved, from Christian on, on, on out, to all the other different people that have done this and are talking about it, never say this is how you treatment plan the case by just simply 
somehow magically making the teeth go to that spot. They always say it's much more in depth than that. You have to figure now that you know where you want the teeth, you have to figure out how to get them there and get them there correctly. But people miss that over and over and over again. And they think that learning the treatment plan is old school and the old way, and we need to do digital. And, and it, in order to be up to date, you've got to show digital and that's not right. That's simply incorrect. It's, those are two, they're two completely different issues and there will never be a digital version of how to treatment plan will never exist because it's a way of thinking. Um, maybe a machine someday, AI can someday treatment plan for us, but it isn't now. Yeah. And it's not for the foreseeable future because there's too many different variables that are involved in it at the, at the present time. So well said. Now, I want you to talk about facially generated treatment planning. If I'm listening to this podcast, Jeff, what is it? Where do I go to find out? What am I going to learn when I go to this um, course? There, there are two great ways of learning a treatment plan. One is uh, where I came from, which is global diagnosis. So if you see Bill Robbins on a program somewhere, um, go see Bill Robbins. And um, he will teach exactly what I'm telling you. So if you see Bill Robbins' name and state meeting study club you're going to go find him the other way is to come see me and greg kinzer out in uh, see it in scottsdale uh, at spear education we run a course called facially generated treatment planning it is a workshop and in that workshop you'll learn the things that we're talking about today which is how to get the teeth in the right location um how to start selecting which tools to use in order to get them in that particular position. And then lastly, something that, that is, um, is not covered as deeply at, in other courses, I feel, and is one thing I think we do quite well, is how to integrate that into your practice, how to talk to patients, how to present this to patients, um, what gets you past those barriers of of presenting bigger treatment plans to a patient. Um, what do you have to do? What are all the steps? Because it's way more, there's way more um, steps and communication and small details that are involved in being able to convince a patient that you are unique enough and care for them enough and skilled enough to actually do that kind of dentistry on them. And they're willing to invest in you. Yeah. It's more than a traditional treatment planning presentation of this is what's broken. Here's what I need to do to fix it. Yeah. Um, so we present that as well. That's awesome. That's awesome. And so for those of you listening, if you're not taking notes, don't worry. We take notes for you. So you can flip up to the notes in iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, everything that Jeff and I discussed. You're going to see an outline. You're also going to see links to facially generated treatment plan. I'm going to highly encourage you to check it out. I know you won't be disappointed. And brother, I'm just always excited to have you back on the podcast. So thanks for being here, man. Thanks. I had a blast. All right. We're going to do I'll it. Go out, I'll go out and get pissed again at something and I'll call you. <laughs> hey, we're going to do it again tomorrow. <laughs> like, uh, no, it'll be awesome. So cool. We'll stick around while we say goodbye to everybody else. But thank you guys for listening to the best practices show. Hey, if you enjoy today, which I know you did, just do us a favor, hit the share button. Keep sending us suggestions for things that you want to see. If you're perturbed at all, any reason about dentistry, send it to me. I'll get Jeff on and he'll add some context to, uh, and we'll solve some problems. It's always fun. Our goal here is to bring on the best thinkers, best educators, give you some great information, help you create a better practice and a better life. So you keep showing up and I'll keep bringing it. So until we see you guys next time or you hear from us next time, keep watching or keep listening to the best practices show. You guys enjoy your day. Mm -hmm.